everybody grace and peace to you welcome to cultivate a thriving prayer life we're journeying together uh desiring a radical rooted prayer life in the very love of god thank you for joining me my name is paul desay it's good to be with you on this prayer journey uh we have this is week three we have been journeying together through this understanding of prayer that may be a little bit different uh, based upon your upbringing and your and your, what you you were taught growing up in church, and I'm hoping that this is incredibly rewarding as you look at prayer, maybe from a different angle. So let's go ahead and, and light our candle today. Uh, the title of this lesson is contemplative prayer. Contemplative prayer. Now, uh, before we get into uh, contemplative prayer, let's review a little bit where we've been. We week one we talked about what prayer is and what it isn't, and we discovered that in order to have a thriving prayer life, it's more important to be focused on whom we are praying to, the, the presence that we are praying, the person we are praying uh, to, than it is the way that we're praying or the methods or the how we are praying. Uh, and that's super important. Uh, the relationship is the goal, right? To build a relationship with the God of love. And uh, that we've been emphasizing that idea that God is love and prayer is this awareness that God is love. He's always love and he loves you. He loves me. And so when we spend time in prayer, we're gazing into the one, the father who loves us completely. That's super important. Uh, we watched a video that first week about a mother who, uh, who gave attention to the baby uh, and then turned away and kind of ignored the baby and the difference between the two. And I, I resonate with that video because oftentimes I have felt that when I pray that God is not really caring about me. He's looking the other way or he's distant. Uh, but that first week we really wanted to, to come to grips with that our father, uh, the first two words in uh, the Lord's Prayer is the reality that God loves us. We are praying to the Father who loves us. He does look into our eyes. He does care about us, He just as we are. He does understand what we're going through and desires to heal us from the things that, uh, uh, like sin, that are destroying us. And He desires to be with us and guiding us and directing us in all things, right? Uh, and so that is super important. So we become like children in our prayer. Um, we become dependent upon our Heavenly Father because He does love us. Now, week two, we talked about peeling the onion. And many of you shared how difficult this was for you to, to, to allow God to peel the onion, to bring healing inside the, the wounds and the trauma and the stuff that we've experienced, whether it's things that have been done to us or things we've done to ourselves, the sin that is like a disease that's torn up uh, parts of who we are. And as we peel the onion, we allow God to deal with the, the trauma in the inside. We acknowledge it. We own it. We, we are broken. We are hurting. We are uh, wounded. And uh, by his stripes, we are healed. God heals us through Jesus. And so uh, we, we talked about healing prayer. We talked about allowing God to deal with our shame and our struggles and our suffering. Uh, and I know that's difficult. But I believe that's an important part of prayer. When we pray to the God of love, who loves us as we are, who sees in us what is on the inside and desires to help us and to, to heal us, when we allow him to peel the onion back and deal with the junk, uh, we become more loving because the things that interfere with love, you know, we talked about hurt people, hurt people. Um, the, the opposite is true, too. When we're being healed, we become wounded healers that extend the healing of God to those around us. And that's who we are in the church that we are uh, we are part of here in Columbus, Indiana. We're wounded healers. And part of that is acknowledging that we are wounded and allow God to bring healing to us. Uh, now today, contemplative prayer. What do you think of when you hear that phrase? Is that something new or is that something you've heard of before? Contemplative prayer? Um, for me, when I first heard the, the term contemplative prayer, I thought it was for monks, right? I thought it was for those guys way out there in the desert, right? They, they have, contemplate, they sit around and reflect, and we're too busy because our lives are, you know, fast-paced and everything to do the contemplative prayer. Boy, was I wrong. Contemplative prayer is for everyone. Let's give you a definition. Uh, contemplative prayer is the unhurried opening of oneself to God through silence, scripture, and self-examination. Contemplative prayer is the unhurried opening of oneself to God through silence, scripture, and self-examination. Guess what? The last two weeks, we've been practicing contemplative prayer. Uh, I just not have not used the name 
to describe it. We've been sitting, gazing into the eyes of the Father who loves us. We've allowed his healing presence to, to, uh, to, to begin to peel back the layers. And so that is contemplative prayer. It is soaking in the presence of the loving God. And so now we're going to talk about what does that term mean and how do we practice it, not just for healing, uh, not just as children looking to the eyes of the Father, but how do we practice regularly this idea of contemplative prayer? How does it become uh, not just something we do occasionally, but how does it become a habit? How does it become a practice that forms us? Brian Zahn describes contemplative prayer. Brian Zahn is one of my favorite authors. He's uh, St. Joseph's, uh, Missouri. He pastors Word of Life Church. And uh, he describes contemplative prayer as sitting with Jesus. I like that. Maybe that's a better description than contemplative prayer. Maybe we should just call it sitting with Jesus. Reminds me of Mother Teresa being interviewed uh, about her prayer life. And the interviewer said, well, what, tell me about what you say to God in your prayers. And she says, I don't, I just listen. And then the interviewer said, well, what does God say to you? And she says, nothing. He just listens also. And and that is a great reminder that we are people, as prayers, we are people that sit with Jesus. And that's an important part of what it means to pray, is to sit and soak up the presence of God. Not just every once in a while, but regularly. Sitting with Jesus. Um... Now, here's the, one of the reasons why this is so super important. And I'm a big believer in science. I talk about science a lot. I believe that God uses scientists and doctors and medicine and all that to bring healing, to awaken us to the truth that God created all things. Um, scientists are discovering that uh, prayer changes our brains. Now, do you remember growing up the commercial on television, uh, This Is Your Brain on Drugs? And it showed a frying pan with an egg frying. This is your brain on drugs. It was one of those videos that scares us from taking uh, drugs. Really good video. But um, uh, we need to shoot a new video that says this is your brain on science. Um, Because our brain is being transformed as we spend time in silence in prayer. Now there's this book, How God Changes Your Brain, by American neuroscientist Andrew Newberg. And he has performed brain scans on, on Franciscan nuns, uh, Buddhist, uh, Buddhist practitioners, Pentecostal believers, and to see how their brains respond and react to prayer. Now, this is a quote from his book, How God Changes Your Brain. He says, intense, long-term contemplation of God and other spiritual values appears to permanently change the structure of those parts of the brain that control our moods, give rise to our conscious notions of self, and shape our sensory perceptions of the world. Contemplative practices strengthen a specific neurological circuit that generates peacefulness, social awareness, and compassion for others. Wow. That is a game changer, my friends. As we pray, spend time in practice, as or in silence, as we pray, God is permanently rewiring our brains so that we're able to experience more peace and extend more peace and love to those around us. That is awesome. I love that. I didn't know that going into this, but this gives us more reason to take serious this practice because we all want that, don't we? We all want more peace. We all want to extend more peace into the world. Prayer works. Here's a few thoughts. Practicing contemplative prayer can permanently and positively change our lives and change our world. Let me say it again because I think it's pretty cool. Practicing contemplation can permanently and positively change our lives and change our world. And one of the chief benefits of contemplative prayer is the lowering of anxiety. Now, we live in the age of anxiety, right? And could it be that the reason we are so anxious these days is we have more noise and distractions than ever, right? But when we practice contemplative prayer, when we uh, get silent before God, our brains are rewired and our anxiety is lowered. Contemplative prayer forms us to love well because love requires calm presence. It helps us to love well because love requires calm.
presence. In contemplation, our brains are being rewired, giving our bodies the expanded capacity to be present with ourselves and with others. And finally, contemplative prayer forms us to love, forms us uh, in love because it aids us in addressing our dark sides, our sins, it renews our minds, and it trains us to discern our words. Now, I'll talk more about words here in a second. Now, there are uh, several, several key passages um, in, in the Bible that talk about contemplative prayer. It's, it's not just something for the monks. It's for the ordinary people, too, like us. Uh, the first is this verse in um, Acts uh, where uh, Luke says, For in him we, have and move, we, ha- we live and move and have our being. Let me say it again. For in him we live and move and have our being. See, God is closer to us than we are to ourselves. God is closer than the air that we breathe. The second idea is that Christ's work on the cross opens the door to assessing, accessing the presence of God. You know that verse in Matthew when Jesus uh, was dying on the cross, the, um, the, the curtain in the temple was torn in two. That is the separation between us and God. And so through Jesus' death, the separation, the barriers that were in the temple that separated us from the Holy of Holies have been removed so that we can access the presence of God, that we can go to the throne room boldly. That's what contemplative prayer is. We can enter into the presence of God. And and third is, um, specifically in John's Gospel, there's this word abide or dwell or remain. Um, and in John 15, where it talks about the vine and the branches, it says, remain in me or abide in me um, or dwell in me. It's this idea of being in the presence of God, like being in the presence or being in the holy of holies in the temple. We can do that now because of Jesus' death on the cross. We have complete open access to God's healing, loving presence. That's what contemplative prayer is. It's about slowing down and being aware of God's presence in our life every moment of every day. Now, we can't be silent all the time, but we can take sections of our life and get quiet and realize, abide, dwell, remain, and so that we're able to um, proceed through our day, through our week, through our month, into the busyness of life with a calmness and peacefulness that comes through being in the presence of God. Now, um, I believe that God calls all of us to be everyday mystics. Now, I'm not sure what you think of when you hear the word mystic or mysticism. When I first heard it, I thought, well, that's kind of spooky. That's witch- witchcraft or something like that. But really, mysticism, being a mystic, is somebody who desires to experience the presence of God, desires an encounter with God, like Moses at the burning bush. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a mystic. I desire to encounter God, to experience God. It's not for the monks or the super spiritual, it's for everyday people like us. Carl Rayner, a uh, theologian, he says, the Christian of the future will be a mystic or will not exist at all. I believe that's true. In the noisy world that we live in, we need to quiet our hearts and experience the presence of God. In that case, a mystic is someone who has a genuine encounter, a genuine experience of God. And now experiences aren't the goal, The feels aren't the goal. The feelings isn't what we're after. But we desire to build a relationship with Jesus. And we do that by being in his presence. That's what a mystic is all about. So um, a mystic is someone who takes seriously the radical presence, the radical availability of the God of love. Takes it seriously. So I believe God calls all of us to be mystics, um, to be in the presence of God. So this practice this spiritual discipline of contemplative prayers for anybody who's hungry, hungry for God, desires more of a relationship with him. It's uh, available to us. It's available to anybody. It's just sitting with Jesus. It's spending time in quiet. Now, this is hard because it requires us to slow down. It requires us to unplug. It requires us to focus our energy and our attention and on the, and the awareness upon God's presence that's always with us, this God of love. And so what we end up doing is we behold God's presence, and then God beholds us. It's this mutuality, this solidarity, in which we spend our time in the presence of love. 
And that's what it means to open ourselves up to his healing love, open ourselves up to the love that transforms us so that we're able to be a part of the transformation of the world. And Jesus often spent time in the wilderness and this, and, and after he was baptized and heard that phrase, uh, you are my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, uh, he was led by the spirit out into the wilderness. Now, a lot of people call contemplative or contemplative prayer time in the wilderness. And I believe that's a really good uh, uh, understanding is that we spend time away with God. We disconnect from the craziness of the world to spend time in the wilderness. And that's what Jesus did before he was tempted by Satan. We often think that Jesus is at his weakest when he was tempted by Satan. But I wonder if his time, his 40 days in the wilderness, was this time of connection with God, uh, reflecting upon his identity as a beloved child of God that enabled him. He was at his strongest through prayer and fasting to counteract the temptations of Satan. And so we, as people, follow Jesus into the wilderness. We follow Jesus into silence. We follow Jesus into a, a, a slower pace. And the way we do that is to carve out time every single day in the wilderness. Now, the wilderness could be in your living room or in your office or on your deck. It doesn't, it's not a physical wilderness. But it's the idea that you're disconnecting from the busyness. You're disconnecting from the noise. And that's the encouragement that I have to give to you as we look into this new week is to slow down. And for many of us, it's really hard to, put, to zip our mouth and to uh, stop talking. It's, it's hard for us to get quiet, um, but we need to. And rewiring our brains, becoming a calm presence in a very anxious world. Now, uh, I did some little research on Twitter. I, I tend to spend a little bit of time on Twitter uh, reading the news, uh, but on average, uh, there are about 12, I'm sorry, 10,000 tweets are tweeted every second on Twitter. That's about 60,000 tweets sent every minute, about 90 million tweets per day, and about 300 billion tweets per year. We're always talking and we're always tweeting. Now, it's kind of funny, but if we're always talking and we're always tweeting, we're probably not listening and we're probably not quiet. And so that is just a reminder that we oftentimes talk without truly having the presence of God forming our words. And so for us, as we unplug and we get quiet, we end up where our anxiety is lowered and we're being trained to respond when we're back into the craziness of the world. I don't know about you, but do you ever respond when you're angry with words of aggression? But if you practice quiet and calmness, spend time in the loving presence of God, when you then react to anger uh, situations that make you angry, you will respond with a more uh, non-anxious presence. In other words, your time in prayer forms you to respond better to the people around you. Your time in prayer forms you and shapes you to be more, more peaceful and loving to those around you. I believe that this is a real game changer for the church. We just spend time, quiet our lives, quiet our hearts, unplug from the craziness, one time, one section, one practice every day, I believe it'll change the entire church and it'll change the world. So here's the, the goal here. To spend 15 minutes in prayer every day, sitting with Jesus. Unplug, quiet, get out in the wilderness. Uh, spend time with Jesus. Just sit there, listen. Or look at the candle if you want to. Just be aware of God's presence and love. He's with you. He'll never leave you, never forsake you. He'll always be there with you. He's loving you. He's healing you. He's forming love in you so that you're able to share love to others. He's healing you so that you can be a wounded healer to those around you. He's changing you to be changed to the world. And that's happening all the time. But when we contemplate, when we reflect, when we put our awareness into the God of love, on the God of love, he will change you from the inside out. Now, I pray that this week, this challenge of the next week of 15 minutes a day is a real, real um, reality check for you about what distracts you, uh, how you are um, addicted to noise and busyness. Are you one that always has to have the television on in the background to give you noise or can you get really quiet? So allow this next week to be a learning experience for you as you sit 15 minutes in the presence of God every day. Journal about what your experiences are, what's distracting you, what's happening as you pray. 
and then share that with someone or with me. Uh, there'll be que- questions on the worksheet to work through, uh, but really just spend time with Jesus and then share with someone with me what your experience was all about. I, I pray that all of us, us can pray get quiet together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. See you next week, everybody. Grace and peace to you.